Hello and welcome to Lofty Pursuits and Public Displays of Confection in Tallahassee, Florida. I'm Greg. Today I'm going to make champagne hard candy. It's going to have a little picture of a champagne glass in each one. But what's really cool, it's carbonated hard candy, so it's going to bubble just a little bit in your mouth, sort of giving you the memory of a real glass of champagne. And although champagne can be enjoyed for all sorts of special occasions, I enjoy it at New Year's because it's part of the tradition. I also like that there are a couple of traditions that people just don't know the origin of. One is, why do we drop a ball on Times Square? And the other is, why do we count backwards to zero to count down the time to the New Year's? And both of these have complicated and twisted histories that tie in with the history of time and how we perceive it. And if you've watched any of our other videos, you'll know this is the type of story that intrigues me. I guess I should refer to this as champagne-like candy because none of the ingredients came from Champagne, France. So far we've poured the hot sugar at 310 degrees onto the candy cooling table and now we're adding the various food colorings. Our colorings today are going to be blue and yellow, yellow for the champagne itself, blue for the glass, and we're going to do blue and yellow stripes on the outside. The carbonation in champagne comes from carbon dioxide and we want to put that in your mouth but we can't actually carbonate a solid piece of candy. So we got to make this happen after the candy is put in your mouth. To the part of the candy that will eventually be white, we add citric acid, and we've done this before. But today we're also going to add bicarbonate of soda, baking soda. When bicarbonate of soda and acid is mixed with water, it does a quick reaction and releases carbon dioxide. And that's what we want. We want little bubbles on your tongue that you can feel. This isn't going to be as strong a reaction as, say, the bubbles from a real glass of champagne, but it will be noticeable. It'll also only be in the white part that's in the center, so it's sort of a surprise. So when you suck on a piece of this final candy, the outer wrap won't have any carbonation in it. And when it finally dissolves, the carbonation will slowly increase. So the more you enjoy a piece of candy, the more bubbly it'll get. This is exactly like the baking soda volcano you made in elementary school, but it's trapped in a piece of candy. So as I fold and drip the sugar to even out the temperatures, let's ask ourselves why we do a countdown every year at Times Square, not a count up. Just listen to the crowd. And a lot of this has changed over the years. None of this goes back forever. I mean, at one point, clocks weren't standard or weren't trusted, so we didn't know exactly when New Year's was. We just celebrated the evening. Something happened in the early 60s that made us do a countdown for New Year's and popularized it worldwide. Here's some footage of a Times Square New Year's Eve from 1965. In the new year ahead. Just a few seconds to go, and then 2,000 watts in eight balls means 16,000 watts of happiness for the new year. Seven seconds, six, five, four, three, two, one. Happy the broadcaster did a half-hearted countdown, and the crowd didn't do any. So I'm going to put the amber sugar on the hook, because I need to make it white. And I'm going to do this by pulling the candy, folding it over again and again, and trapping air bubbles in it. This is going to do double duty. One, it's going to make the candy white, but two, it's going to increase the surface area of the candy in your mouth, which will allow a larger amount of it to be exposed to your saliva and make this bubbling effect I'm going for a little stronger. Now let's look at a Times Square New Year's Eve eight years earlier in 1957 before it goes to 1958. Listen to the crowd. If this was now, the entire crowd would be chanting the time in unison and they're not in 1957. So what happened between 1957 and 1965? Well, this man happened, Alan Shepard, the first American in space. You see, we used a countdown for rocket launches and the country became rocket crazy and along with that, we became countdown crazy. I'm not saying there were never countdowns. I'm saying they weren't in popular culture the way they were after 1961 when we sent the first American into space. While the countdown became popular because of rocketry, the use of countdowns in rocketry came because of this man, Werner von Braun. And Werner von Braun liked the countdown. You see, he'd been using it already when he worked for the Nazis helping Hitler launch the V-2 missiles on London, where it killed several thousand people. He was the best rocket engineer, and after the war, we kidnapped him and used him to send our men to the moon. But he liked the countdown because he thought it was cool. You see, 
he saw it in his favorite movie. I'm going to start here by mixing some yellow in with some white to make a pale yellow for the inside of the glass of champagne. Verna Von Braun's favorite film was Woman in the Moon. Now, Woman in the Moon was a film by Fritz Lang. It was a silent made in 1931. And if you haven't seen it, you really should. You may recognize the name Fritz Lang. He also did Metropolis, which is one of the masterpieces of silent films and of silent science fiction. But I think Woman in the Moon is better. It hasn't gotten the acclaim, but he made it a few years later and he became even a better filmmaker. In this film, Fritz Lang predicted so many things right, and he did this because he consulted with Hermann Oberth, a German rocket scientist. He predicted multi-stage rockets, he predicted how water would be used in the launch to some extent. He even had straps on every surface so people could navigate in zero-g. We use Velcro now, but it was a similar concept. But he wanted something suspenseful for the launch. And for that, he did a countdown. And this is the origin of all rocket countdowns. So every rocket countdown is actually a film trope turned into reality. And it was turned into reality by Verna Von Braun. It was popularized in the 1960s because of the early rocket launches, and then we started using it everywhere, including for New Year's. So the New Year's countdown is a film trope from 1931. And for some reason, this really makes me smile. If you want this candy or any of our others, you can always get it at our store in Tallahassee, Lofty Pursuits, or right off I-10. But you can also get it online at www.pd.net. Check out our website. I've been building the champagne glass design bit by bit in this log of candy. And you can see what I'm doing at any given point with the little icon on the upper right. The ball dropping on Times Square actually traces its roots to 1829. The technical term for what it is is a time ball. It had a different purpose before dropping on New Year's. You see, if you know exactly where you are on the planet and you can see the stars, you can precisely calculate what time it is. And every city of any merit had a observatory that did this. The biggest one in the world was the Greenwich Observatory in Greenwich, England. But you can remove any one of those elements time, place, and stars. So if you know the exact time and you can see the stars, you can figure out where you are in longitude around the planet. And this was difficult to calculate and they couldn't do it before they got clocks on ships. And that's a completely separate story. So it, when you left port, if you wanted to know where you were during your travels, you had to have an accurate clock that was set accurately. And the way to do this was to set it off the observatories, which weren't necessarily very close to the port but they were up high on the top of mountains where they got a clear view of the sky. So some bright guy got the idea of putting these giant poles on top of the observatory. And at either noon or 1 p.m., depending on which port you were in, they would drop this ball that could be seen by the ships about to leave port, and they could set their clocks on it. You see, when the time ball was started to be dropped on Times Square, it was something that everybody knew what it was. It wasn't like this was just a unique item to Times Square and to New Year's. This was something that everybody saw every day from every major city. Of course, with the advent of better clocks, digital communication, and radios, this wasn't necessary anymore. But when Times Square started doing this, in 1907, it was a common knowledge item. It's funny how we forget things like this. And now we taper the log of sugar, and we end up cutting off the end, which is distorted. And we sell that in the store. We call it a unicorn dropping. For our image candies, we get two of these, one at each end. Now we carefully pull the logs into rods off our batch roller. We do this in such a way that we manage not to distort the image, at least not too much. And then we put it on our candy anvil and we cut it into individual bite-sized pieces so we can bag it up and send it out to you. And in the description, once again, we're putting some links to some unloved videos of ours and a link to Tom Lehrer's song about Werner Von Braun.
All that's left is the taste test and for somebody to make sure the little bubbles are as delicious as we think they are. Thank you for watching. This is Greg here at Lofty Pursuits. We're located in Tallahassee, Florida, right off I-10. If you ever drive by, we'd love to see you. We're open from 7 a.m. to 10 p.m. We don't make candy all the time, but we do make a lot of it and you might catch us. And if you can't visit us in person, we sell our candy online and ship it worldwide. Just go to www.pd.net and you can order our candy online. You can also follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And make sure you subscribe to us here on YouTube. We don't produce a huge number of videos, but we hope you like this one and we bet you'll like the others. Thanks again for watching.